Hello class, this is Dr. Harden back again, uh, continuing our lecture series in Intro to Pastoral Counseling at Johnson University. Uh, this lesson, Lesson 3A, we'll be discussing uh, your struggle. Now we'll go, we're going through our basic textbook, which is Paul David Tripp's Instruments in the Redeemer's Hands. And so that's kind of where our focus is going to be. So much of this material will be either from Tripp directly or from Scripture. Uh, so let's get started. Well, the first thing that, that we need to understand is problems in relationships, according to Tripp, are problems of worship. To better understand conflict, we're, we're going to have to see how it tends to work in the hearts of people. And there's a pattern that conflict normally takes within the heart of an individual person. Because so if you think about it, counseling is about helping people with problems in living. And one of the key components of any problem uh, in life is that of conflict. Conflict with a person in God, conflict with a person uh, and others, conflict with a person and him or herself. Remember the, the trifecta of alienation we've talked about before. When the fall occurred, uh, man was separated from God, separated from himself and cre I mean others and creation, and separated from himself. And so if we can work through as counselors an understanding of the pattern that this conflict will normally take within the heart of the person, we can work our way through the remaining sets of relationships. You see, this pattern can help us better assess how to help other people, including yourself. Well, who are the enemies in this conflict? I think we see that in Ephesians 2, 1 through 3, and I'll be reading from the New American Standard Bible today. But, but let, me, let me read this passage, and then we'll kind of talk about that for just a moment. It reads this way. And you were dead in your trespasses and sins, in which you formerly walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, of the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience, among them we all too, we too all formerly lived in the lust of our flesh, indulging the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, even as the rest. And what we find here is that there are three sources for problems in living. Here's what they are. The world, the devil, and the flesh. And I think that that's broad categories. Ephesians 2, 1 through 3 talks about that. But we also have to make sure that we are taking a proper balanced view of those three things. I'll say this here and we'll hit on it later in class. Since our greatest problem is the deceitfulness of our own hearts, we are self-deceived. We believe what we want to believe. We have to be very careful that we understand that given a, an opportunity to shirk taking personal responsibility for our own behaviors, if we're given that opportunity a hundred times, we're going to take it nearly a hundred times. And so, therefore, we have to be very careful. We're not trying to blame everything on the devil. That's not to say the devil's not active. But we have to make sure that we own what we need to own. And we also need to make sure that we don't try to blame everything on society and on the world because the problem is there on the outside, but the main problem is in the heart. That's what Jesus said, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. And so we've got to, we've got to make sure we maintain a proper balance of all three of these enemies. And by the way, to encourage you, regardless of which enemy we're talking about, what we'll see as this course unfolds, is that the cure is the same, and it's redemption through Jesus Christ and a deepening of your union with Christ. So, so no matter what, living that normal Christian life of growing in the vine, if you will, growing more deeply connected to the vine, is actually the answer regardless of what three areas or what three directions the problem's coming from. So that's just a, a little bit of a beginning. Now, let's talk about the main source or the battleground 
of this, of this uh, conflict, and it's the human heart. There are a couple places in Scripture that describe this pretty, pretty well. There's a war within, and we see that war within raging in Romans chapter 7, verses 14 through 25, says this, For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am a flesh sold into bondage to sin. For what I am doing, I do not understand. For I am not practicing what I would like to do, but I am doing the very thing I hate. But if I do the very thing I do not want to do, I agree with the law, confessing that the law is good. So now, no longer am I the one doing it, but sin which dwells in me. For I know that nothing good dwells in me, that is, in my flesh. For the willing is present in me, but the doing of good is not. For the good I, that I want, I do not do. But I practice the very evil that I do not want. But if I'm going, but if I'm doing the very thing I do not want, I am no longer the one doing it, but sin which dwells in me. I find then the principle that evil is present in me, the one who wants to do good. For I joyfully concur with the law of God in my inner man. But I see a different law in the members of my body waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner of the law of sin, which is in my members. Wretched man that I am, who will set me free from this body, the body of this death? Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ, our Lord. So then, on the one hand, I myself with my mind am serving the law of God, but on the other, with my flesh, the law of sin. This was written by Paul as a believer. And the reason we know he was a believer, he talks about how he wants to do the right thing. Unbelievers don't want to do the right thing. He talks about a struggle. He doesn't talk about uh, an abundant life in the sense that there are no conflicts going on within his heart. And so therefore, we've got to understand that the battleground is going on within the heart. Um, And it's also a matter of, of trust. Jeremiah 17 speaks of this pretty clearly. Verse 5 through 10. Let me read that to you. Thus says the Lord, Cursed is the man who trusts in mankind and makes flesh his strength and his own abilities and whose heart turns away from the Lord. For he will be like a bush in the desert and will not see when prosperity comes but will live in stony waste in the wilderness, a land of salt without inhabitant. Then he makes a turn here. Jeremiah makes a turn. He says, Blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord, and whose trust is the Lord. For he will be like a tree planted by the water that extends its roots by a stream and will not fear when the heat comes, but its leaves will be green, and it will not be anxious in a year of drought nor cease to yield fruit. And then this is a very important verse, pivotal verse, verse 9. The heart is more deceitful than all else and is desperately sick. Who can understand it? I, the Lord, search the heart. I test the mind, even to give to each man according to his ways, according to the results of his deeds. The question becomes, when we're in conflict in our hearts, Who are we going to trust? Who are we going to trust? And that's where the battleground is. is, That's where the battle is waged. That's the field of battle. So moving on. Tripp talks about what he calls the descent into conflict. And it's James 4, 1 through 10. Tripp says there's a desire that leads to a demand that results in a need that then gives birth to an expectation. Then comes a disappointment and ultimately concludes in punishment. Let's look at it this way. 
The desire screams, I want. The demand when you're dealing with someone else or with God or even with yourself says, I must. The need says, I will. And then all of a sudden there's an expectation. You should. And then there's a disappointment. You didn't. And then there's a punishment. Because you didn't, I will blank. I think back um, here in East Tennessee in the Knoxville area. One thing about the folks here, they love Tennessee volunteer football. And one of the things, and I think this is probably like fan bases just about anywhere that have big-time football programs. Usually in July and in August, the dog days of summer are coming and everybody's getting excited about the upcoming football season. And there's a desire to, to win the national championship every year. Now, Tennessee's not won it since 1998, but, but that desire is there nonetheless. And what ends up happening is, is in the spring when people are talking in April or May, you may hear something like, well, we hope we win eight out of 12 games. Um, but as time gets closer to the season, that number seems to change. It, you know, I think we can win nine, and by July, uh, maybe 10. Well, before the first ball is kicked off, uh, fans in their minds think to themselves, you know, I want us to win all of our games and win the national championship. And whoever the coach is at the time, the thought is, I need you to do that. You need to do that. You need to beat Alabama for the first time in X number of years. You need to beat Florida. You need to win all the games on your – and by the way, you don't need to get anybody hurt, and you need to beat them 100 to nothing and then go for two at the very end of the game as time expires. Because if you don't, I will cease to have meaning and purpose in my life. And, and if you don't believe me, you can listen to any sports talk radio station late summer, early, early fall, and as the fall unfolds, this is how it goes. Well – once reality hits and they don't win as much as they should, people start getting angry. And then you start getting the phone calls and then the accusations, the innuendos, and even trumped up charges against coaches. I've heard that before because they must be punished because it has nothing to do with usually the trumped up charge. It has to do with the fact that I will cease to have meaning and purpose in my life if we don't win all of our games this year. Now, I know that sounds totally bizarre to people, but that's how the human heart works. That's just a real-life example, as silly as it is, that affects a lot of people, and it's, it's just a, a very good model for what we see. So there are consequences. Well, how do we climb out of that? Well, we climb out through the indwelling of the Holy Spirit and our union with Christ. You know, quite frankly, um, our eternal destiny and our, 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 our relationship with Christ needs to be more important than not only any football game, but anything else in this world. And so we've got to remember that if we want to get out of this uh, descent into conflict. So what did we learn? Well, Tripp argues pretty persuasively that relationship problems are worship problems. We also experience these problems because we don't get what we want. We make up in our minds that we must have something. Now, let me read real quick. Let me read James 4 to you just so you'll get the, the setting of that and how, how that sounds. 1 through 10 says this. What is the source of quarrels and conflicts among you? Is not the source of your pleasures that wage war in your members? You lust and you don't have, so you commit murder. You're envious and cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. You do not have because you do not ask. You ask and do not receive because you ask with wrong motives so that you may spend it on your pleasures. You adulteresses, do you not know that friendship with the world is hostility toward God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Or do you think that the Scripture speaks to no purpose? He jealously desires the Spirit which He has made to dwell in us? But he, has a greater, he gives a greater grace. Therefore, it says, God is opposed to the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Then he says this, Submit, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. 
Draw near to God, and He will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Be miserable and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned into mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves in the presence of the Lord, and He will exalt you. So I say that to say this. Remember how I said earlier that regardless of which direction the problem of living is coming from, if it's the devil, if it's the world, if it's yourself, if you will humble yourself for God, if you will seek His face, then things are going to turn out okay. So to overcome our problems, we must simply change our objects of worship from self to the triune God. And as we do this, the indwelling spirit will deepen our unions with Christ and our experiences will reflect more of the glory of God instead of the self-glory that we struggle with. I hope that this lecture was helpful. Uh, Remember, you have to take the online quiz that will be in Sakai. Um, I wish you well and God bless and I will see you next time.